I'm Brandi Cruz. Today on Undivided, Democrats are pushing forward with a bill that would give counties the power to increase your property taxes at a faster rate. Plus, small steps toward protecting kids from drug abuse, but is it enough? And an unbelievable story in a local newspaper gives readers the green light to flip cops the bird. That and more coming up today on Undivided. Remember, you can support our show for just five bucks a month by signing up at UndividedPod.com. Hello and welcome to Undivided. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for your commitment to giving common sense a comeback. It is a commitment we try to practice every single day, preach where we can, send you out into the world with your heads filled with common sense to preach it to other people. Good little, uh, I can't call it a religion, I guess. Don't want to offend anyone. You know, political religion, common sense, that's not so bad. I want to start with breaking news, then I'll get to um, something that's going to happen today that just proves that the government is the greediest institution of them all. Uh, we just saw this on um, social media. Kathy McMorris Rogers, the congresswoman who represents Washington's 5th uh, district, who at one point you know, was one of the most powerful uh, Republicans in Congress, um, she has announced she's not going to seek re-election. She said on uh, X this morning, after much prayer and reflection, I've decided that the time has come to serve the people of Eastern Washington in new ways. I will not be running for re-election to the People's House. She said it's an honor and privilege to represent the people of Eastern Washington uh, and goes on to talk about some of the things that they've done. She says, my family has been in my corner from the start. In fact, we had just had uh, coffee with a member of her communications staff who uh, was in town and likes to kind of meet some of the reporters that they talk to. And one of the things we were talking about during that meeting is how hard it is to have a family and also have that travel schedule back and forth to Olympia. Uh, she says, every day, my number one priority is to pray. I pray that God's purpose over my life will be more deeply rooted in uh, my heart and in gratitude for the remarkable colleagues and people he has brought into my life, no matter the division. We must unite in prayer. And as we do, we will bring hope and healing to broken lives, broken families, and broken systems, failing broken people. Together, may we always be guided by God's abundant grace and wisdom to keep the promise of America alive. Um, the best is yet to come, she ends it. I'm, I'm kind of surprised by this. I mean, I like to think that I've got my pulse on things. And I saw this, I was like, what? Um, just because she has been, I think, really a stalwart member of Congress from the Washington delegation. And, and frankly, I was also surprised when Democratic, uh, a Democratic member of Congress, Derek Kilmer from the 6th, announced, I mean, he's a pretty young guy, announced that he was going to not seek re-election. And so now the 6th is an open seat uh, as well. And, you know, I think we've seen this really across the country from some of the more sane <laughs> members of Congress, where it's just become too much. It's become a sideshow and a joke. And for uh, politicians who actually want to go there and do work for the people they serve, and I'm not saying that's why Congressman Kilmer or Congresswoman McMorris Rogers is leaving, but I do think that there has been a trend and a pattern. And I, I you know, for both of them, there are aspects of their politics I don't agree with, but I, I do think highly of both of them. Uh, and I, I believe that both both of them were in um, Congress and running and in those seats for the right reasons. And I don't believe that of all members of Congress, not by a long shot. And so I have to wonder, you know, is the state of our political discourse scaring away people who are effective, who are in it for the right reasons? And um, I, I, this is one of those people. And I would hope that there's a recognition of that, regardless of people who might disagree with her politics. So uh, just starting with that breaking news today, Congresswoman Kathy McMorris Rogers deciding she will not seek reelection. We will see the power vacuum that that creates and who rushes in to fill it. That's always a fun uh, waiting game to see. I'm sure it'll only take a couple of days. Uh, and we'll reach out to the Congresswoman's office to see if she'd like to come on and talk more about uh, this decision making. OK, we hear a lot from Democrats about greedy corporations. We've got these initiatives running. A couple of them would repeal taxes, including the capital gains tax. And the no on that initiative has already said that they're against greed. You know, opposing that initiative is about opposing greed from rich people. And I said at the time, the greediest entity that exists is the government. The greediest entity that exists in Washington state 
are Washington state Democrats who control the government. There is no, no, no tax they won't try. There is no tax they won't try to raise. And there is no tax that they won't push, even if they don't even know what they'll spend the money on. You look at the taxes that are rolling in, and I do call it a tax, from the Climate Commitment Act and the Carbon Trading Program, a tax that we're paying at the pump, a tax that burdens working class people the most. They have so much money from that thing, they never even dreamed how much money they would be bringing in from that, which is why they want to hold on to it so closely. So here you've got, in the last couple of years, look at the new sources of revenue that the state of Washington has gotten. Capital gains tax just started, people just started paying into it last year. The long-term care tax that just started coming out of your paychecks in July. And then of course the carbon tax at the pump, which has been happening since the beginning of 2023. Our state government has more money than they know what to do with. And I would argue that some of the counties in our state also have more money than they know what to do with. Yet something really uh, not surprising, but I think indicative of how greedy our state lawmakers and Democrats are, happened last night around 7 p.m. A proposal to lift the property tax lid from 1% to 3% was pulled out of the Rules Committee by Democrats, and it's being rushed to a floor vote in the Senate today. Uh, we don't know when that's going to happen. I pinged some people. Uh, only the Democrats know when that's going to happen. Republicans are like, we have no idea. So let me explain what this means. So this is Senate Bill 5770. I've talked about it before. Uh, and what it would do is it would give counties... Um, the ability to raise annually your property taxes more quickly. So right now there's a 1% cap, which means regardless of what county you live in, they can only raise your property taxes by 1% a year. This would change that to 3% a year. It says the legislature finds that the arbitrary 1% limitation on the growth of property tax collections has severely inhibited the ability of counties, cities, and special purpose districts to provide critical community services in the face of significant population growth and inflation. Modifying the limitation on the growth of property tax collections will restore the prime tool local officials use to fund law enforcement, fire departments, and other uh, fire departments and other services Washingtonians rely on. So you think about think about how much your property taxes have gone up. I mean, just by the value of your home. And I mean, obviously, for homeowners, they see the value of their home going up, and they're like, great. But also, along with that, the the taxes assessed on the value of your home also go up. You think of all the ways that they're coming after you to increase your taxes because you are a homeowner. And now, Democrats want to. And by the way, why are they doing this? Let's get to this first, actually, the history of this. So Washingtonians have been very clear they don't like in property tax increases when it's been asked of them on the ballot. Uh, they feel overburdened. Housing is completely unaffordable for working class people. But what happened to get even in this era of like tax after tax after tax in Olympia? Well, in 2023, something happened back in October. King County Executive Dow Constantine, the only county that Democrats in Olympia care about, Dow Constantine come, came out and said, if Olympia doesn't do this. If they don't cut, if they don't give us more taxing authority, we're going to go bankrupt. It's going to be the worst thing in the world. And we're going to have to get rid of all these programs. Here is a clip from a Como News story back in October of 2023. We're told cuts to services such as public health, the county legal system, and elections workers are coming next year without a change in the state law to allow King County to boost property taxes. Yeah, the headline on the Como story, King County warns of dramatic fiscal situation if capped on, cap on property taxes doesn't change. A county with, the, with, again, more money than they know what to do with if they didn't squander their money on dumb things like DEI initiatives and homelessness response programs that do not work. So Dow Constantine comes out and warns just in October of a dramatic fiscal situation. Oh, public health? Mm, I'm going to have to cut that. Elections workers? Oh. We're going to have to cut that, all the little trigger words, unless we're given the authority by Democrats in Olympia to raise our property taxes at a faster rate. So what do they do? Of course, this is the priority of Democrats in Olympia, which is wild. So this happens last night. Republicans realize this been, that's been pulled out of rules committee, and they're like, they're going to put this thing to a vote quickly. They're fast tracking this. And so I'll give uh, Republicans credit. Overnight, they cobbled together a, a pretty big press conference this morning where they had community members, they had some trade groups, they had Republican lawmakers who came out uh, 
to tell people, hey, this is what's going on and here's why it's bad. Uh, so this is Senate Republican leader John Braun. People have been overwhelming on this issue. You can go all the way back to, to 1997 with Initiative 747. Uh, you can go back to 2007 when the, the state Supreme Court overruled that uh, initiative and we were set to have uh, uh, no limits on property taxes again and there was nearly a public uprising to the point where uh, then a Democratic-led legislature and a Democratic governor, Governor Gregoire, called a special session, came in here and overwhelmingly approved this limit. They've done this and we support this because the people support it. They've been very, very clear that uh, they want this limitation on local government. Yeah, but I think it's pretty clear that when you have one party in control that feels increasingly emboldened, like they can do whatever they want, they don't care if the people support it or not. I mean, that's really the point to them. And you see that in the timing of this. Again, I go back to those six initiatives. Three of them are anti-tax initiatives. Collectively, all of the initiatives which seek to undo democratic policies got 2.6 million signatures representing more than 800,000 Washingtonians. So at a time where you have this overwhelming demand especially on the issues driven by people's pocketbooks where they're feeling stretched thin. So at that time, you have two initiatives that would seek to repeal taxes. You're going to push through a major new taxing authority at a time when a, a, a key issue Democrats are talking about is affordable housing. You're going to push through a new taxing authority that is going to make home ownership less affordable and price some people out entirely. Someone help, so, someone help me understand how this makes any sense. And at the same time, you have more money than you know what to do with from all the new taxes you've put through over the last couple of years. When is enough? When is it enough for Democratic voters? When is it enough for people who say, oh, that feels good, that feels good. You say you wanna fund that, you wanna fund that. I'm just gonna sign off on it, keep signing off on it, keep signing off on it. When is it enough? Uh, Senator Braun went on to talk about this issue of, you know, the timing of it with all these under pr all other pressures that Washingtonians are under financially. We just keep layering on one more, one more thing after another. And this one is worse than most because, as I said earlier, it grows. And this ends up being, you know, after 10 years, about a $6 billion tax increase. And then, it, it, you know, almost a billion dollars a year after that because of the compounding effect. This is an enormous, uh, you know, ta if fully implemented, this is an enormous tax increase, especially in the out years. And I don't think there's any question. People are having trouble affording to live here right now. You have people who, who could just barely make it six months ago and probably have even gotten a raise in the last six months uh, and, and can't make it today. You know, food, gas, housing, uh, child care, health care, they're all going up because we keep adding more regulation to each of those. Yeah, and I go back to something I've said before, which is like taxes are higher than ever. We've got this bloated budget that has doubled in recent years. Our salaries, your salaries haven't doubled. But what do we got for that? If we were living in some freaking utopia where we didn't have a homeless crisis, we didn't have a drug crisis, we didn't have a crime crisis, our police departments were staffed appropriately, our fire departments were staffed appropriately, the roads were wonderful, there wasn't congestion, public transit was great. If we had all of that, then I might feel differently. Like, wow, that is a government that is firing on all cylinders. When we give them a dollar, they make that dollar stretch. They use that dollar for things that we need, but that's not the position that we're in. We keep shoveling money toward them, some of the, us willingly, some of us go kicking and screaming and we don't get what we want. And then they just waste it. They might as well light it on fire. And now they want to give every county in the state the ability to tax people more. You know, I was having this conversation with Bruce Dammeyer. I don't even know if, if this was a, it was just a chat we were having about when Dow Constantine said, we're in a dire fiscal situation. If you don't do this, Bruce Dammeyer was saying to me, you know, we'd be, we're just fine. Like, how are we just fine down here? And in King County, they're saying it's a dire fi financial situation if you don't give them the authority to tax more. So there are some counties like under Bruce Dammeyer, I don't think Bruce Dammeyer is going to be in there like, yeah, we can lift the property tax lid. We have the authority to do this. Let's jack it up because he understands fiscal restraint and responsibility. And if we don't need to take it from people, we don't take it from people. King County has no such restraint. 
they will come up with ways to spend money. They just want to get the money from you. More on the housing affordability front. Um, a woman named Christina Janis spoke. She's a realtor and she's a member of the Building Industry Association of Washington. And she talked about the real struggle in attaining home ownership and also mentioned um, the challenge for veterans. My husband is a disabled veteran. We've used our VA benefit. I work with new construction in Laceyside, which usually is a benefit, uh, benefactor of JBLM. We haven't seen VA loans because the affordability of a VA loan is, well, mortgage payments, period, offset. So that BAH that those soldiers are collecting do not pay for their mortgage, not, not even cutting it in half on some of those soldiers. So I've seen, and that hurts my heart. I mean, these people are out there on the front lines. I think at least we can do is provide them safe and affordable housing. I don't think that's too much to ask for. So I think the affordability in general, I mean, and we're also dealing with inflation and all these other like interest rates. Interest rates have locked people in. People aren't moving. That's why supply and demand. Our inventory is still low and we don't have who's going to sell if they've got a 2.75 mortgage and right now we're sitting at 6.3 so you've got those discussions at play too but it just breaks down to affordability and we just have that I don't even like to use the word affordability anymore I like attainability because it's not even attainable anymore yeah. So I don't want to hear Jack from Democrats about, oh, affordable housing. We need more money for affordable housing to make housing more affordable while you are making it so unaffordable for people. And it's there in black and white through the regulations that you're imposing, through taxes, et cetera. Uh, I don't want to, so I don't want to hear Jack from uh, Democrats moving forward about affordable housing. They're completely disingenuous on that issue. And I also don't want to hear Jack from Democrats moving forward about how they're the party that cares about the middle class. You don't care about the middle class. You have a governor who won't even admit that his Climate Commitment Act is hurting the middle class, will not even acknowledge that it's to blame for raising gas prices, even though his own staff said that's what it's designed to do, continues to lie about it. And Democrats, with the exception of maybe one, Senator Mark Mullet, who's admitted that, yes, that's, that's increasing gas prices, Democrats cover for the governor on that. So you can't own your policies that in, impact the middle class. You don't actually want affordable housing. And you will continue to take and take and take and take from Washingtonians until somewhere along the line, I don't know when, they stand up to you and they say, OK, might not love Republicans, but Democrats ain't doing it. So let's just try something new. So we're going to monitor this again. Democrats pulled this out of the Rules Committee at 7 PM last night. Uh, so we're expecting a vote on the floor of the Senate to increase the property tax lid from 1% to 3%. Yay for home ownership. Love it. It's great. All right. Uh, I want to update another bill that we've been talking about on the show that had a lot of folks pretty angry, including uh, State Representative Travis Couture, who is sort of this is his passion issue this session, and I can understand it. And it, 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 the conversation became kind of renewed after there was a story out of Port Townsend. A three week old baby was found dead in a bush. His father was arrested. Um, and you know, this guy who the Department of Children and Families gave this child back to, again, who was temporarily in foster care, was born addicted to fentanyl, with fentanyl in, in the child system. But DCYF and a judge put this three-week-old in the custody of a dad who didn't have a house to live in, who was a felon and a known drug user. And then the kid ends up tossed in a bush in his car seat dead with blood dripping from his nose. So this renewed a conversation about a bill, a law that was passed on a bipartisan basis a couple years in Olympia called the Keeping Families Together Act. And what it did is it basically raised the threshold to be able to take a kid out of a home. And it used a threshold called imminent harm, where you have to prove that there's imminent harm before you remove a child from a home. Or, you know, if you've got a child in foster care, you don't send them back if there is proof of imminent harm. The issue we've sort of begun to find out is in how that legislation was interpreted. And a lot of judges are interpreting it in a way that says that drug abuse in the home, active drug abuse in the home, is not necessarily imminent harm. Most of us would agree that that's ridiculous, especially with a drug like fentanyl that can kill an adult in the smallest of portions. So imagine how easily a baby can be killed by exposure to fentanyl. 
So the idea that that's not imminent harm is absurd. It's dangerous and it's crazy. So there is this, I would say slightly bipartisan, I'd like to see more from Democrats, but there's been a recognition that, okay, maybe this is not being carried out in the way that we were all led to believe it would be carried out, which is fine. If you can acknowledge that, hey, that bill didn't work out the way you wanted to and you're gonna fix it, great, but let's make sure that fix is sound. So Representative Travis Couture, a Republican from Allen, came on the show and he had his own bill that would explicitly state it is imminent harm to use any kind of illegal drug in the home when you have a child there. And so it would make it easier for the courts to take like a baby like that three week old away from that dad. So he's pushing that bill. And meanwhile, Democrats start pushing a watered down version of that bill. So the Democrat version of that bill is House Bill 2447. It says an act relating to supporting children, families, and child welfare workers by improving services and clarifying the child welfare process in circumstances involving high potency synthetic opioids. And to give Democrats credit, they do acknowledge in this bill, they say the legislature finds that since 2018, there has been a significant increase in the number of child fatalities and near fatalities involving fentanyl. And so they're acknowledging at least there's a correlation here. Um, and we've especially seen those numbers tick up since the Keeping Families Together Act went into effect. So the difference between Travis Couture's bill that he came on to talk about and this watered down Democratic version is that the... Democrat, the Democrats version only has to do with synthetic opioids. So it's not all drugs across the spectrum like Couture's was. And also they don't say in this bill that using a drug like fentanyl around a child is imminent harm. They say that a judge needs to give great weight, great weight. So basically consideration to the fact that a parent might be using fentanyl. So they're trying to get a judge to think more about whether that would be something that should preclude a parent from getting their child back. So not as strong as the Couture bill, but it doesn't prove it a little bit. And this Democrat version was actually passed out of committee this week. I think that that is a positive development. I do know, and I'll play a video here, Representative Couture uh, put out a video of they tried left and right and up and down and diagonal to get this, to improve this version of the bill. So they were in committee and Representative Couture and other Republicans introduced amendment after amendment after amendment to try to strengthen the Democrats bill. Here's a clip. The problem with great weight is that it could be applied differently across different jurisdictions and it's like kind of the lowest standard. Back in committee, we tried presumption and that was probably the wrong way to go because it's likely unconstitutional. But luckily for us, there's a middle ground and that's rebuttable presumption. It essentially says we presume that this is a danger, but we give the parents a chance to rebut that presumption. So this is the middle ground amendment and this is the amendment that I truly deep down in my heart believe will be the bullseye that helps protect these kids from needless deaths because of high potency synthetic opioids like fentanyl and Trank. I, I really feel that we need to accept this amendment. It is going to be the best thing that we can do to perfect this good bill right now. Uh, it does need work. It's not the sweet spot. This is the best thing we can do and I, I really need your support on this amendment. Thank you. I had some language drafted that was fairly strong intent language uh, for this bill and I, I would like to tell you why because I'm, I'm happy that we are finally talking about fentanyl in Washington State and the damage it can do to children and family but just two weeks before we came back to session about two miles from my house a young four-year-old girl was in a hotel room with her parents her father who had a protection order against him and is a former a drug abuser and the mom and dad were in the bathroom and the little girl knocked on the door. This is a newspaper article where uh, this, the eight-year-old brother had testified. The little girl knocked on the door to tell her mom she was hungry. And after being hungry, uh, they didn't come out of the bathroom. She died and they took her to the hospital. She had two rainbow Skittle fentanyl pills in her stomach and one up her nose. And I think we really need to start sending a stronger message in Washington State, which is why I made changes to the intent section. And so I'm encouraging a yes vote to show in Washington State that we care about kids. 
was hoping not to get to this amendment, um, but uh, here we are. And what this amendment would do is basically tell Department of Children, Youth, and Families when there is a situation where there's uh, fentanyl present, the underlying bill says, yes, it is an imminent harm. There's a lot of language that says it's an imminent harm, but we want them to go file a dependency petition. And so by doing so, we can, even with the great weight language, try to protect these kids a little bit more. I think that there's an underlying culture between Department of Children, Youth, and Families in our courts, where social workers and caseworkers are discouraged from going to the courts for a ver uh, various reasons. And we want to bring back the culture that says, hey, uh, first we protect the kids, and we should file for a dependency when we see this, what we're now writing, trying to write into law that is an imminent harm, and we should do so to make sure that we have max protection for kids and the least amount of uh, needless child deaths in our state. Thank you. Yeah. Amendment to make, to make the bill better so more kids don't die? Rejected. I mean, over and over. And that was just a couple of them. So they made some real concerted efforts in this committee hearing to strengthen this bill. They weren't able to do it. So it advanced out of committee, though. It was passed out of committee. And I think the good news is it's better than the law is now. And when you're in the minority party, like Representative Couture is, you do have to kind of take what you can get, and I hate to put it that way, but there's still an opportunity for that bill to be improved in debate on the floor. So there's opportunities to introduce, to introduce amendments and throughout the process before something happens. But I will take this over nothing every single day of the week. And if you care about this issue, again, it's House Bill 2447, House Bill 2447. I would encourage you to continue to email your elected leaders about it and let them know how you feel about the difference between great weight and imminent harm and protecting kids from the these dangerous, dangerous drugs. It shouldn't be controversial. This should be bipartisan. The safety of the kids should always be the priority. Okay, coming up next, wild story. We heard from our friend David Rose over at Fox 13 uh, this morning. A convicted killer, a man who was just convicted of murder in a court of law, is right now sitting at home comfortably sitting at home as he awaits sentencing. We'll discuss why. But first, I hear, I see in the chat today there's some talk about First Mark. Somebody said their kid's car insurance went up, so they're going to call First Mark. I would strongly encourage you to do so. Become a member of the growing First Mark family. Imagine having a local company on your side that's been doing this for a long time that can help you navigate the insurance industry, and it costs you nothing. That is First Mark Insurance, firstmarkinsurance.com, firstmarkinsurance.com. Mike and I took the First Mark Challenge about a year ago now. We are so happy we did. And this is a really important time to have an insurance broker on your side. The insurance uh, industry, you know, they have these sort of, it's a little bit of insider jargon, but they have these baseline numbers they want to be at where they're making money or they're underwater. And they've been underwater for some time, and so they're just cutting out people dropping policies on people who they think are too much of a risk for them. And sometimes the standard for that can be really low. And if you don't have someone like First Mark in your corner to fight for you, you're going to be left dealing with that all by yourself. Here's Dave Taylor, the CEO of First Mark. I'm seeing good signs right now in the fourth quarter reports we're getting from carriers that their profitability numbers are turning around. Those combined ratios that I mentioned earlier at the 130 range, 120, 130, those are dropping now. Some carriers are even under 100. So it, it's going to be first they have to get those numbers in line and once they do then the underwriting will loosen up and we'll hopefully get back to a place where insurance companies are profitable and they're looking to write business and grow again yeah so we'll see if that happens but uh in the meantime having someone like first mark in your corner is just i mean it saves you a lot of time we We've heard from so many people who save hundreds of dollars a month. So you think about how that adds up in the course of the year, because when you do the First Mark Challenge, they're going to talk to you. We did ours virtually about the insurance you have and about your needs. And they're going to tell you, hey, you really need this. This is really important. But if you've got stuff you don't need, they're going to be like, get rid of that. You're paying for something you do not need. So it's a really important process to go through. Firstmarkinsurance.com, firstmarkinsurance.com. They work for you. Okay, a convicted killer is sitting at home on uh, electronic home monitoring, even though he is awaiting sentencing for, again, a homicide that he's now been convicted of committing. To explain to you how unusual this is, so usually, you know, you can you usually get some offer of bail um, unless, you know, they're in the rare circumstance these days would a judge say, hey, you're, 
you know, on trial or you're charged with murder and you're going to be held without it, remanded without bail. Because it's a constitutional right to have bails. Usually in murder cases, though, it's like two million bucks and a lot of people aren't going to be able to come up with the collateral and the cash needed to put down to be able to get out. But anyway, I want to introduce you to a guy named, is this really his name? Yep. Okay. Your Highness Jeremiah Bowler is his name. And we heard about this from our friend David Rose because Your Highness Jeremiah Bowler was actually on the Washington's Most Wanted list and have been featured on that show. This is the tweet from David Rose this morning. On Wednesday, Your Highness Jeremiah Bowler was convicted of murder in the second degree. Prosecutors argued he should be remanded to jail pending his next hearing and sentencing. Instead, King County Judge Leroy McCullough let the convicted killer go home. So a little bit of context here, and we'll talk about the crime he committed momentarily. So we looked into the court records and the jail records. Jeremiah Bowler, your highness, sorry, your highness, Jeremiah Bowler, he initially, when he was arrested on this homicide back in 2018, his bail was set at a million dollars. And I would say that's around typical for a second degree murder um, charge. At some point down the line, it was dropped to $300,000. And then he agreed to electronic home monitoring. My guess is in the process, having covered a lot of these cases, that his defense attorney said, hey, if you drop the bail, then we'll agree that he has an electronic uh, bracelet and home monitoring. And so a judge did that. Bail was dropped. He made bail. And he's been sitting at home awaiting trial with an electronic home monitoring device. But then he goes to court and he's convicted of murder in the second degree on Wednesday. Typically, even if you had been out on bail, you're remanded to the custody of the Department of Corrections because now you are a convicted killer. Now there is no question about your innocence or guilt. But instead, David Rose says, and what we saw in court documents is, that a judge decided, oh no, he can just continue on his home monitoring until his sentencing. And one of the reasons that's truly crazy is now this is a guy who knows that he's going to prison for a long time. He has nothing to lose. There's no hope, no glimmer of possibility that maybe he'd be acquitted or he, you know, whatever, is not going to be convicted for some reason. Now he knows he's going to prison for a long time. I'm sorry, but if that were me, I'd flee to Mexico. If that were me, I would flee to a country without extradition. And that is the danger because sure, you have an electronic home monitoring device, but you really think there's someone looking at it 24 hours a day like, oh, is he still there? Is your highness still at his house? Is he still there? No, they might get a notice that he's breached that perimeter. But by then you're gone. You're gone. You think this guy's coming back to court at 50 50 chances are 50 50. So a little bit of background on him. So again, this uh, homicide happened in 2018 and essentially there had been some sort of um, confrontation in a parking lot where he shot and killed 22 year old or uh, 31 year old Andrew Carter, October 18th, 2018. So anyway, he flees the scene. Um, Detectives, you know, find him and he tells him that he shot this guy because he thought he was sent there to kill him or to steal his car. So that's why he shot him. Uh, After the shooting, he said he drove to Renton where he told police he quote, arranged to have the gun thrown in the ocean and have the car sold to some Mexicans. Detectives say he told them he got the gun, quote, on the streets. And as Fox 13 pointed out, uh, this is the second time, that was the second time for the homicide, that Bowler was caught thanks to tips from Washington's most wanted viewers. So this is someone who, before the murder, had a criminal history. King County Sheriff's detectives arrested him on October 16th, 2014, after he was identified from surveillance video during a smash and grab burglary at a Newcastle jewelry store. He pleaded guilty to two charges of burglary, criminal trespass theft, and attempting to elude police. He also has a conviction for attempted unlawful possession of a firearm in the first degree. So let's get this straight here. This is someone who has a history of fleeing from police. Did it back in 2014. Did it after the homicide. Told police that he got the gun on the street, so he's well connected on the streets. He was arranging to have the gun thrown in the ocean and have the car sold to some Mexicans. So this is a guy who in my opinion, should not have been given electronic home monitoring in the first place, but certainly not after the point of conviction. So what is that judge's name again? Thank you, David Rose, for naming the judge. Let's normalize naming the judges. King County Judge Leroy McCullough. So if anything happens, if 
Your Highness Jeremiah Bowler commits another crime while he is awaiting sentencing, hurts another human being, flees from justice to avoid prison time. It is on the hands of King County Judge Leroy McCullough. Ridiculous. Okay, um, one uh, story from the show this week that I want to follow up on because honestly, it's been eating at me. Nicole knows I've been sitting here like stewing over it in the lead up to the show sending angry emails about it as a concerned citizen. Sometimes, like, I do my podcast thing, but then things will bother me, and then I'll switch over and do my citizen thing (laughs) and send, like, emails to lawmakers and stuff. And I'm not 100% sure what it is about this particular case that has frustrated me, but it has to do with what's happening at Green Hill School. So we talked about this latest King Five investigative report about this juvenile detention facility uh, called Green Hill School in Lewis County and how it's been a disaster. You have all these crimes occurring there. You have smuggling of drugs that are coming in, sometimes with the help of guards. Jay Inslee says, oh, it's not a problem at all. One of the issues is you've got kids, quote unquote, as old as 25, who are put in these juvenile facilities. You've got escapes happening from some of them. But anyway, so now there's all this renewed attention on Green Hill. And this place was so mismanaged that when they found contraband, be it um, ch- chivs or something or drugs or phones, they'd seize it and put it in a locker with the name of the person who the contraband was seized from. But they weren't turning it over to police. So they weren't pursuing, because that's an additional case, right? If you get caught with that, they were just putting it in a locker and there it stayed. But now that there's this renewed focus on what's happening at Green Hill, now that police are getting the cooperation they want from Green Hill because of all this pressure, you have Lewis County prosecutors who are digging into the vault, literally pulling out these old bags of contraband, figuring out who had it, and filing cases against them. Now... I'm okay with that in some instances, but the example given by King 5 News about a man, a young man who was in Green Hill a few years ago is deeply disturbing to me. In Lewis County Court, prosecutors have charged two dozen of the old Green Hill cases with more filings on the way. Some of the crimes occurred years ago, raising the question, is it fair to charge them now? I've been saying out of trouble I've been working. Shaquille Woods of Everett now faces felony possession of a cell phone at Green Hill, a case from more than two years ago, and one that threatens to upend his life. Me and my girl live here, like, trying to be a better person, and this is just holding me back. They're trying to lock me up. I've been out for two and a half years on probation. Can you tell me how you got your cell phones? I just asked the staff to bring me my cell phone. I paid him. I paid him. I sent it to his P.O. box. So I would say that one, there's a couple things that bother me about this. One of them is that he got this cell phone with the help of a crooked guard. Is the guard being charged? Has the guard been charged with the crime? You know? And so that to me is like, this was a a terrible environment where you've already got criminal young people and with ease, they were able to do these things. So I want to know like, Okay, if he has to be held accountable for it, which he did it, right? I mean, he knew. There's no way he didn't know that he couldn't have a he couldn't have a phone in there. So if he has to be held accountable, what about the guard? What about DCYF? What about the governor's office that continues to not deny these issues and has led to these problems? And obviously, my other issue with it is it's been two and a half years. You just pulled this out of the vault. He's got a baby on the way. He ha- is gainfully employed. He, according to him and uh, what he says, he's had no new law violations. And so now you're going to put another felony on him, which, by the way, he's in court for this tomorrow. And how is that supposed to, even for people like me who are very law and order, actions have consequences. How is that supposed to, now that he's out and moving forward with his life, how is that justice? So this is just bothersome to me, this whole mess from Green Hill. And the way you're fixing it is going back in time for drugs and contraband that should have been handed over to police immediately. It's almost as if this is their way to make up for the failures of Green Hill and for the failures of DCYF and the state of Washington. And it bothers me. And Nicole, something crazy happened yesterday. Mm-hmm. So we're sitting here and we do that story. Yeah, I was trying to tell you earlier. Sorry. I, you had a cut. I was listening to that. And if you saw me go like this, it's because I was trying to tell Nicole <laughs> that her hair was all over the place. I'm a good friend. Thank you. But I just didn't do it quick enough. Okay. Um, we so, were we we're watching this, and you were like, that name, it sounds so familiar, the Shaquille Woods. You know his mom. 
Yes. So, yeah, just, I know his parents. And so. I ranted about it before I knew, because Nicole mm-hmm. told me after the show, I know his parents. So I was already ticked off about it, but now I'm like, well, now it's his family. <laughs> I was like, now it's his family. Now I'm really mad. Yeah, I talked to him this morning. I think he's going to talk to us, but he's yeah, a little, little bit, bit nervous interview. because obviously they just are going after people for weird reasons or we're not really sure. And so, but yeah, he's in court tomorrow. And originally the prosecutors told him that he would have to spend another 60 to 90 days in jail. And he said, dude, I got a baby on the way. I, I like, I have a I've job. I have all been... this going for me. And so then they call them back a little later and they're like, okay, well, if you plead guilty, then we'll like no time, but you have to have but this felony, have felony on your rec- right? record. Right. Yes. And, and it's tough for me because I'm really caught in this sort of like, I, how many times in the show do I rail against taking it easy on people who break the law and all these things, but this is such a different, unique circumstance. And if you're not willing to at least acknowledge that something like this seems unreasonable, Mm -hmm. then it's like, okay, you know, somewhere along the way you do, I'm not saying you throw the book at every single person. I I am saying like, hey, maybe don't let everyone off the hook because that doesn't teach them any lessons. Mm -hmm. But I asked this of subscribers today in our daily subscriber show poll because I wanted to know like, why am I so, am I alone on this hill that like Lewis County prosecutors, what are you doing? Are you just trying to make the governor or DCYF look good? Like, oh, we're now finally, to doing me, this then they can say look at where we're bringing all right. these charges on all these things we're catching up we're catching up we're but catching then it's at up. the expense of all of these kids who maybe were able to make it out of this corrupt place right. with and actually get their life together um and they're that's, just making it you worse. have to have discretion if you're not using prosecutorial discretion then what are you doing and i can't imagine being in the head of someone who would look at this case and be like listen uh, we're going to charge some other ones, but not this guy. That's ridiculous. Right. So I asked you um, on Patreon, Locals, and X in our daily subscriber show poll, do you support charging these cases? Yes, no, or yes, but only if they're still incarcerated. Because I think that's a key difference, right? If they are still serving their time and they've done this and you're getting on these cases, then it's like, well, yeah, I'll do that. So I think my opinion is yes, but only if they're still incarcerated. Matt Gilbert says, to go after people who are out and turning their life around is petty and enforces the industrial prison complex. If they are arrested for other crimes, tack it on. If they are still in jail, enforce the law, but don't come back years later to people who have been doing everything right. Carlene responded to that and said, unfortunately, that's how it really works. Like I said in my comments, I feel like it depends on the crime or violation. I've had to go through this. And I do think it depends on what the violation was. Like if you got caught with a knife or something or whatever it was, but again, you have to look at it in the totality of the circumstances. It, I said this on the show yesterday, you went out and after Green Hill, you, you committed more crimes and you're back in. Yeah. That's someone who has shown no ability to turn their lives around. So yeah, go f- charge them with the shank they created in Green Hill and I'm you know, hoping, a few years ago. I'm hoping we get to talk to him a little more about this, but yes. it's also the culture that they had created. So, I, I mean, he obviously knew he wasn't supposed to have a phone. However, when right. he got told that he was going in there, they're like, oh man, you're good. They get everything over there. And I mean, this was the culture that had been created, that there were no consequences. So again, if, you, if there's no consequences, you're not really real or you're not thinking about oh there's going to be a felony on my record again. another right. felony later well, down yeah, the line you're, these you're, are kids you're ruining their lives even more going forward which yes. is supposed to be the opposite of what juvenile detention is mm-hmm. you're supposed to be getting them back on track you think allowing them to bring drugs in having staff that help them bring drugs in having no consequences for a phone the second mm-hmm. that it's found you think that that is helping them get their life back on track no and then you got the rare instance where shaquille's over there like hey man i'm doing <laughs> what i'm supposed to be doing and now you're coming back to me with this extra felony and it's so wrong it boils my blood on x Mm -hmm. christian said he actually supports it um he said it's a deterrent uh, which i do think deterrence is important but like what behavior are you standard while you're there right yeah standard while you're there um k kick jj2 says i don't think the person serving time should be prosecuted uh just the employee who sided um who helped with the illegal behavior and that's what i want to know too is and from prosecutors, okay. He says he got this, he, you're charging with a felony. He says he got it from a guard, sent him money in his PO box. Right. Surely you can figure out who that guard is. Let's give the guard a felony too. Right. The guard has a duty of responsibility. The juvies, the juvie, juvies, and they're mm-hmm. committing crimes. The juvie's doing what the juvie does. Right. So th- that is, this is. They were told if they get caught with the phones, the guy will ask him to unlock it. So just yeah. be aware that you'll have to unlock it for somebody if you get caught with it. Yeah. That was what they, mm-hmm. I mean, that's what he is told as a child in juvie <laughs> that is going to be the consequence. So yeah. Matthew Cook silly. says, we talk about accountability all the time. So as long as the crimes fall within the statute of limitations, charge away. And I get it. Like I said, I've admitted. I am like, 
Yeah. I am a big proponent of accountability. Yep. But, and the statute of limitations exists for a reason because it's sort of giving you that, okay, how long are we going to let that sort of lord over someone's life? Weisscastle has an interesting point, says charging them is often the best way to build a strong case against the corrupted employees who have facilitated the contraband. So if you, like, let's say that prosecutors are pursuing a case against that employee, and then if that employee's defense person will be like, well, you haven't even convicted someone of having contraband. So if you need B to achieve A, fine, but let's find out if that's the case. But I mm -hmm. still think, again, Shaquille Woods is in court in Lewis County tomorrow mm -hmm. where he is supposed to plead guilty to this deal because the alternative is they said he's got to go back to jail. So that's one of the things, too, that our criminal justice system does that I do have a problem with is it's innocent until proven guilty. You have constitutional rights in this country, but you have prosecutors who will hold a decade in prison over your head if you don't plead out a case. So you're stuck in this situation where, let's say, you truly don't believe that you're guilty of what they're, they're accusing you of, where you can risk your entire life, put your whole life on the line and take that to court, mm -hmm. or you could admit to doing something that you did not do for a sweetheart plea deal. Now, do I think that is the, that's the exception, not the rule? Yes. I think most people who are char charged with crimes committed the crime. Right. <laughs> I think that mostly that is true. But have we seen instances where they truly did not or what, where a case was overcharged? That's been an issue too, is cases will be overcharged to try to convince the mm -hmm. person to take the deal, which the deal is where the charges should have been all along. Right. So I'm, I'm law and order, but I also don't agree in abuses of the system that take away mm -hmm. people's liberty or uh, put their constitutional rights in a, in a vice where they are left with no choice. Right. No, I think that I I think that's all well said, Brandy. But I would I just was thinking that they I I think that they're offering these deals because they know once if it, if they were to challenge it, right, it wouldn't hold up. Like this was a failure of the system. This is a failure right. of the officials put in charge of the system. So it wouldn't hold up. It would hold it, up because he did it. Well, but I mean, all they have is something and a bag with his name on it like that's all they have they yeah. don't have the guy that found the phone they don't have they don't have anything to prove it you they know have, that well that's what i'm i i've seen is they seen the have case. things with a you know they had they just have this one guard that finds these phones has them unlock it takes it and puts it in a locker yeah what all do they have to I, i'm just saying right. i think that it's a weak case and there's all this failure of the system that you can work with and it's time and money and effort and all mm -hmm. that and it's easier to make a deal i get that but also it's all ridiculous and they should look at it yeah. and be like this is ridiculous two years ago this guy has learned what he was supposed to learn in this facility or being locked up and now he's being a productive member of society yeah Let's i mean i think i want to be careful like here that. and not like painting him as some like perfect citizen no, no. who didn't you know who, and i'm not saying you're doing that but right. it's like he did the crime, obviously. He, you know, had this phone. He's admitted to it. Now right. he's admitted to it publicly. So they now. do have all the evidence they need. <laughs> they have a confession. Now they do. <laughs> where he says that he did this. So let's not, like, I do believe that, you know, you need to be accountable for your actions and own your behavior. But we are also talking about, again, it goes back to using judgment in the criminal justice system. And there's a lot of people who I will advocate for, throw the freaking book at him, and we've used a lot of our power to mm -hmm. do that. But when I see a case like this, it just doesn't sit well with me, and it lets the state off the hook, it lets DCYF off the hook, it lets Green Hill off the hook, and that bothers me. Brandy Cruz, social justice warrior. I like it. Give me I, some pink I hair. Mean, something's got to change down there. This change. is just out of control. And this isn't it. This isn't it. You think this is going to no. fix Green Hill by doing this? Too late. The other thing that uh, I learned while researching this is that this has been going on for about 20 to 30 years. Yes. Green Hill has been a problem not just recently as we've seen crime escalate, but this has been a thing about Green Hill for about 20, 30 years mm -hmm. that they knew that like that was an easy place to go. That's where you wanted to get sent. No one wants to fix it. I just mm -hmm. said I need pink hair. Somebody said keep your red hair, Brandy. My hair's not red. Right. It doesn't because it's up against your red outfit today. Red. Maybe it looks a little strawberry. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with redheads, but this is not red. It's a little strawberry. Strawberry. Okay, mm -hmm, gotcha. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, uh, okay, we're gonna get to our segment unbelievable next. Oh man, we are going long today. I know. Holy moly. <laughs> okay, you got to work in the background to let our one one fifteen appointment know that we're running a little late, Nicole. Okay. Anyway, this is the danger of doing a live show and having so much to say. Uh, we've been talking about the Fed, interest rates, and where they're at, talking about home ownership and how Democrats are just trying to make it 
incredibly expensive and you're already dealing with these high interest rates and we don't know when the Fed is going to drop them. The Fed said, we're going to do three rate cuts in 2024. Hasn't manifested yet. Zach Abraham with Bulwark Capital says he's not even sure that it will this spring. Where do you think interest rates need to be at oh. to really get the market back up and humming again? That's not I Zach. <laughs> do you have Zach? It's not. Yep, here we go. <laughs> Nicole, she's just really I thought we were doing down. this later. So. Oh, wait. Yeah. Why is it in my script here? <laughs> okay, let's start over. Okay. Start over. We've been talking about interest rates and where <laughs> they need to be at to get the housing market up and running again. Our friend Wes Jones with sellwithwest.com uh, said if the Fed will increase interest rates, obviously that's going to bring out more home buyers, and so it's going to be a good time to have your house on the market. Where do you think interest rates need to be at to really get the market back up and humming again? I think if we get into the high fives, that is going to be a real breakthrough. You know, we got when we were at seven and now into the high sixes, that brought in uh, another section of buyers. And if we get that into the low sixes or high fives, I think things will really start to move again. And, you know, we're already seeing multiple offers in a lot of different price points and, you know, different cities. It's just, it's going to make housing more affordable and it's going to bring more buyers out into the market again. What's that going to do? It's going to push the prices back up. So one of the things that I do see happening or could see happening in 2024 is all of the gains that we lost in 2022. I think there's a really good chance we make those up in 2024. But it will depend on the Fed deciding to drop interest rates. In the meantime, though, if you're thinking about selling your home, reach out to Wes Jones, sellwithwest.com, sellwithwest.com, because it's important to get your home ready to hit the market before we get to a really good place to have your home at the market, and then you're not ready yet. So do that work in advance. Talk to Wes Jones, sellwithwest.com. Start by simply using their home value calculator to see how much your home is worth. It might be worth more than you think. Okay, the Tacoma Tribune wants you to know that you are allowed to flip cops the bird if you'd like to. Let's talk about it in our segment, Unbelievable. Boop. All right, let's look around the internet and see what the fourth estate is using its power to do today. Trying to hold people accountable, do some important investigative reporting. Let's see, Tacoma News Tribune. Oh, here it is. Headline, can I get in trouble for giving the middle finger to a Washington cop? How the law works. Why? <laughs> Unbelievable. Why? Why? So Why, ridiculous. Nicole? Why? I don't know. Here's the thing. Love the Constitution. I have in my purse right now. Where are you, Nicole? Come back to me. Come back to me. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> in my purse, I have a pocket constitution. Yeah. And I know my rights. I know free speech. Do I need the Tacoma News Tribune to write an entire article and dedicate their journalistic abilities to letting the citizenry know that, yeah, if you want to flip off a cop, go right ahead? And then give Weirdos? advice for if yes. you do. <laughs> so here's part of this article. It's been established in U.S. courts that giving the middle finger is a protected activity under the First Amendment. In general, the only communication not protected under freedom of speech is, quote, fighting words like threats. What if I flip off a cop? Can I get in trouble for that? <laughs> so I was like, weird advice column, right? Uh -huh. However, cops interpret disorderly conduct on a case-by-case -case basis. It's possible an officer may believe they have grounds for a disorderly conduct arrest. In that case, you should consult a civil rights lawyer. <laughs> hey, if you're out there flipping off a cop and you get arrested, I'm sure, wait, did they list a bunch of good civil rights attorneys in the state I didn't of Washington? Feel this, no. The lone act of flipping someone off should not be considered grounds for disorderly conduct, but paired with other actions, an officer may interpret your actions as breaking the law. What in the world? <laughs> what in the world, Tacoma News, News Tribune. Tribune? I'm a subscriber to the News Tribune. I expect better. I expect better. That is absolutely unbelievable. Don't flip cops off. They've got it hard enough right now. <laughs> Keep your middle finger to yourself, okay? Uh, all right, let's get to some national news quick. We're going to skip that PETA story because we're running short on time I today. Know. We can get to it later. It's a good one. It's a good one. Uh, but it is... Uh, Thursday, after all, and so we're going to check on what's happening in the Sunshine State and maybe what's happening in their legislature there. It is our segment, Florida Report.
It's not even controversial anymore. People know in Florida their freedoms are going to be respected. Miranda, hello. How are you? I'm just doing great. How are you? You look 37 today. Oh, horrible thing to say to me. No, <laughs> just look, kidding. You look I am tall. I am 37 today. The last time I saw you, I was the ripe young age of 36. Yeah, we had a lot of birthday wishes that came in for you. So I would just Aww. say birthday wishes on behalf of the undivided family. So we've been talking on the show today. We started with the insanity happening in our state house in Olympia. And so let's talk about the opposite of that happening <laughs> in the Florida. No, in Florida, sometimes there are some crazy bills. Um, the yes. first one is interesting. They're trying to loosen some of the, I guess, child labor protections for 16 and 17 years old, year, year olds. Yeah, so the bill that's been proposed um, that has actually passed the House already and it's he heading into a vote with the Senate um, would allow 16 and 17 year olds to work over 30 hours a week during the school year. And it would also allow them to work past 11 p.m. Um, if they chose to do so. So, I mean, I think that I think I don't have any problem with this. I do think that everybody has kind of control over their work schedule to a certain extent. And if a kid can't do, make that happen or doesn't want to work that much, they don't have to. I think 16 and 17 year olds are pretty sound mind to make those decisions. And in an increasingly expensive world, maybe even contribute to the household or save for college. Yeah. I mean, the last thing we need to be doing with this generation is making it hard for them to work more, <laughs> you know, yeah. work well, there's to the bone. Some One of the Democrats that opposed the bill had said something like, and don't, it's like not, this isn't an exact quote, but they said something like, um, just because we don't want them at home playing Minecraft doesn't mean we need to put them back in the mine. <laughs> oh my God. So dramatic. <laughs> well, and again, and it's up to parents too to decide how much of that work life balance or school life balance can can these kids have. And so yeah. I think this is a good step in letting the household really dictate. And some 17 year olds, I mean, for all intents and purposes, are kind of doing their own thing already and are pretty mature. So the idea that they can't do more than 30 hours a week. Um, I get it. You want to focus on your education, but let it up, yeah. let it be up to parents to decide what their kids can handle that. Okay. Uh, another bill, uh, this one I love, and I don't know if it's necessary in Florida, but it's kind of one of those, like, we want to let people know where we stand bills. So it has to do with, and is in response to these removals of, of historical monuments, like tied to the Confederacy and things like that. And not even that, like presidents who they're like, oh, his fifth cousin twice removed had a slave. Take yeah. his statue down. Exactly. Um, basically, SB 1122 would be just to protect all historic monuments and memorials within the state, whether that be, um, you know, like the slavery memorials we have all the way to the Confederate monuments that we have. They'd all be protected. DeSantis had basically said, like, you know, history is history. We learn from it. We don't. But like, we're not going to deal with removing George Washington's name from schools because it's getting so out of hand. And the Republican senator out of Fort Myers that actually filed this bill had said that accurate history belongs to all Floridians in perpetuity. So and I think that's that's correct. Like if even if we're shameful of our history, like having a consistent reminder of it sometime, I think is just as important as taking it away from us, you know? Yeah, and it's a historical lesson. I mean, if you come up on a Robert E. Lee statue, maybe you update the plaque or put a plaque next to the existing one, like talking about how history re remembers him or whatever it is. You are robbing people of an opportunity to be exposed to those aspects of our history that they might not have otherwise been exposed to. So um, I'm glad that this is moving forward. Hopefully it's never needed, but with all this happening, maybe it's good. Um, Washington State, they're pushing bills that we don't need, like octopus farming. Let's ban yes. octopus farm, even though we don't have octopus farms. So I get it, it's kind of a similar vein, like let's stop the removal of these statues, even though the governor says he'd never allow it, but you don't know who the future governor would be. And I'll tell you, a Democrat would allow it in a heartbeat. Um, okay. One more. This is really funny. Not funny. It's not funny. However, so you one time we were doing like an ad or some um, a PSA for our annual earthquake shakeout, like earthquake preparedness. Yes. And you we taught you the training for what to do in an earthquake, but kind of laughed at it because you, you have hurricanes there and earthquakes aren't a real big issue for you there like they are here. There is a very rare earthquake in Florida. There was just about 100 miles off of the coast of Cape Canaveral, there was a 4.0 magnitude 
earthquake that hit just six miles below sea level. They don't think that it's going to cause any sort of tsunami issues, oh, thanks. but people on land did feel it and reported it. And we're like, what the heck is that? Because it's not like a normal thing to happen to our ground. Our, we have sinkholes. That's what the earth does to us. It sucks us in. It doesn't shake us to oblivion. But there's only been two other earthquakes in history over 3.0 magnitude recorded in Florida. And one was in 2001 and the other was in 1900. So they're very rare here. So for us to have one is a little bit interesting. That kind of freaks me out, actually. Yeah. And I mean, I'm sure by now, if there had been a tsunami issue, we would know about it. So yeah. Appreciate your late notice on that, though, that heads up, guys, no tsunami from this earthquake that happened hours and hours and hours and hours ago. However, um, now you know what to do. Do you remember your training? Cover. Okay, uh, that comes before that. Oh, do I duck? Drop. Okay, I drop. <laughs> drop, okay. cover, and hold. Yeah, so you're going to go under something sturdy, trying to get yes. you prepared for maybe if the big one hits Florida and not Washington. Get under something sturdy. If you're inside, drop cover and you just hold on and cry if you want, whatever, scream out for help until yeah. the shaking stops. All right, Miranda. Okay, well, let us report back if the tsunami ends up hitting. Like, I, I feel like if this tsunami hits, I can't drop cover and hold. I think I got to do the opposite. I think yeah, I got to go like, run from that I'm... high ground. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, which is I'll hard to know. find in Florida. So, all right, Miranda, we appreciate it. Bye. It's not even controversial anymore. People know in Florida their freedoms are going to be respected. Meow. Meow. Yeah. I, I hope that now it doesn't flip and we get a hurricane in Washington. I don't know what I would do in a hurricane, although sometimes the rain feels an awful lot like hurricane force rain and winds. Nicole, is it okay with you if we get to Zach Abraham now? Is that fine? Do please, you want to play another cut do. with with our friend Wes Jones. <laughs> I mean, we do love Wes, he's great. No, I'm just kidding. So I wanted to talk to Zach on the show today about this whole Jeff Bezos thing. So we talked on the show yesterday about how Jeff Bezos announced he's selling like a bunch of Amazon stock by the end of 2025. And we talked about it because in doing so, he's gonna avoid about $600 million in Washington's capital gains tax. But also I had some people in the chats and stuff saying, well, does he know that we don't know? Like if, if Jeff Bezos selling all this Amazon stock, should we sell our Amazon stock or what? So we asked our stock ep expert, Zach Abraham. Zach Abraham, welcome back to Undivided. Thank you for having me. Good to be back. Yeah, let's talk about Jeff Bezos today, who's enjoying his yeah. best life in Florida and is about to save $600 million from not having to pay the capital gains tax. That must be nice. Yeah, way to go, Washington State, right? I know, right? Them and their brilliant tax policy, yeah. I mean, everybody's like, oh, he's trying to get out of paying. It's like, yeah, I mean, if I could get out of paying $600 million and also move to Florida, sign me yeah, up. Yeah, or, or just take the savings and donate it to chair. Are you kidding me? Like, you can't think of more, like, efficient places to send money than Washington State government? Yeah. I don't know how you fault Jeff Bezos for that. I, I would applaud him if he came into my office. I'd tell him to do the exact same thing. Yeah, I mean, you're better off burning a stack of $600 million than giving it to the government to burn for you. So, Well, yeah, because you can at least get warm. <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? And then the you, government, you can, they're just going to spend it on their plan to take away our gas stoves or in our, in our gas fireplaces. Yeah. And so we're just left in the cold. And yeah, you could he could burn that $600 million for the rest of his life if they take away a gas stove and you could just yeah. have it in there, right? You, it brings s'mores into the mix. We right. could do a marshmallow roast, hey, hot like, dogs. Uh, uh, there's all kinds of different things you could do that are far more useful than what Washington State would do with it. Washington State would burn it and we wouldn't get invited to it. We, we, we wouldn't get a roast of weenie or, or a marshmallow. Exactly. You know what I mean? Same thing. I wonder if a marshmallow tastes different when it's, when it's roasted over $600 million. 100, it tastes like a gilded marshmallow. Right. It's just, it tastes like cash money. That's the, that's the way. It, yeah. Yeah. I, love I wouldn't know. Now I only burn, I only burn 10 and $20 bills. Yeah. You know, I, it's, it's, I try to keep it, you keep a low profile. Reasonable. I wouldn't burn hundreds, but if you ever tasted a fire, a $20 fire roasted burger or, or marshmallow, it's, it hits different. I'm telling you. It is. You appreciate it more. 100%. Yeah. So in all seriousness, Bezos announces, or there's an announcement of this plan, that he's going to sell up to 50 million Amazon shares by January 31st of 2025. So I think, I mean, I saw some chatter online, like, does, does he know something we don't know? I mean, Amazon's been doing really well in, in the stock market, but they're laying people off. 
And now Jeff Bezos is selling a bunch of shares. How how much do we read into that? Look, um, anytime somebody is selling that big of a, a, a chunk of, you know, we, one of the things we do in our research is we actually look at and watch uh, what we call insider transactions. Um, insider transactions can give you a ton of inv- a ton of information. Um, but one of the first things you want to look at is, okay, that's a lot of money. How big is it as a representation of his entire stake? Uh, it's, it's, it's sizable, right? But it's not, if he was dumping 25 to 50% of his stock, I would say you, regardless of what he says, I would say 100% sell. Yeah. Okay. Just automatically. Um, I don't think this amount adds up to that. And if people are saying, you know, does this tell us something about the stock market? If you need that news article to get nervous about the stock market, I I really can't help you. Right. Um, Without, and I'm not trying to say this isn't marketing for me, but without protection and some type of defensive part of your portfolio, I just, I don't even know how you navigate these markets because these stocks, look, we may look five years from now. I don't know the future. We may look five years from now and go, those companies weren't overvalued. They ended up being worth it. I will just tell you that that's never happened. Yeah. So is it possible? Yes. Has it ever happened? Are there any comps we've got to it? No. Today is a perfect example. A lot of the stuff in our portfolio was flying. One of our biggest positions was up four and a quarter. Second biggest position was up two and a half. We had a bunch of stuff that's won. We still slightly underperformed the market today. And you know why? Because we don't own big piles of NVIDIA, Amazon, Apple, right? Those things. And we don't because the prices are ridiculous. Yeah. And great companies would love to own them, but I'm not buying them at this level with my worst enemy's money. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, maybe rather... I'd do it to my worst enemy. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Jay Inslee, maybe. Hey, Jay. Nancy <laughs> Pelosi and, and Joe Biden, I'd load them up on this stuff. Oh, so bad. <laughs> Oh, man. Okay, Zach Abraham, thank you. So bottom line is Jeff Bezos, good for him, avoiding the cap gains uh, tax, but don't read too much into that. Yeah, I would say it's a non sequitur. Just kind of wipe it off. Okay, Zach Abraham, we appreciate it as always. You bet. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I still don't know how much I believe that Jeff actually left to avoid $600 million in taxes. I mean, that probably helped. Maybe it sped up his decision, but like $600 million really isn't that much to Jeff Bezos. Anyway, uh, election is here and it's upon us, which is really unfortunate. There's a lot going on, global unrest, rising cost of living, market fluctuations that are just wild. So 2024 is going to be crazy. Make sure you're protecting your retirement portfolio with risk management. That's why I suggest having a free Know Your Risk portfolio review with Zach Abraham. He is the chief investment officer at Bulwark Capital. He also hosts the Know Your Risk radio podcast. Their portfolio review, it's a great way just to see if you're overexposed to risk. There's no obligation. In fact, Bulwark doesn't even let anyone invest with them after their first meeting. So schedule your free risk review now at knowyourriskradio.com. That's knowyourriskradio.com. Investment advisory services offered through Trek Financial LLC, an SEC registered investment advisor. Investments involve risk and are not guaranteed. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. All right, let's get to questions and comments on the live stream. A lot of comments about the potential for property taxes to go up even higher. If you're in some counties, you might be okay with that because you have county leaders who don't feel the incessant need to tax you at every turn. But if you're in King County, Dow Constantine asked for this thing. You can bet as soon as he's able, he's going to jack up your property rates 3% every single year. Krista M says, my property taxes were three times more expensive in Washington than here in Montana. The same size property here and over twice the size of a house. Sounds better by the day. Deanna Sanderson says, if the 1% cap on property taxes is increased, I will be forced to move out of state in order to retire. I'll be looking into Tennessee. And we don't want to see you go, Deanne. Uh, Sharon Barber says, our property tax doubled when we got occupancy on the small home we built ourselves in rural Okanagan County to save money. And now they want more taxes. This is crap. Uh, Let me see here. Todd Welch says, cities have wanted this 1% lid lifted for years. I have attended enough meetings with other city council members, and it has been talked about forever. A couple more here. Uh, Lene Comstock says, I went to show up as a citizen at the press conference. Oh, good for you at the press conference this morning. Awesome. 
Uh, Tracy says, such a terrible bill for struggling families and seniors on top of the huge levies we are facing from schools and local fire. This will definitely impact these people terribly. Uh, and with loss. I don't know if that's where the sentence actually ended, but uh, Matthew Cook says, big middle finger to seniors on fixed incomes. They want everyone in little rows of ugly box apartments. Yeah, well, that's what you're going to get, right? You're making everything else too unaffordable. Uh, Greg Olakis, uh, one comment here on the bill that would try to protect kids from drug abusing parents. Uh, Greg says children deserve love, safety, security, protection, and a chance to grow up and have a life and to grow up and have a life with their family. Yes. I mean, you're not doing anyone any favors this, if you're not getting that parent to get help and honestly not having custody of their kid for some parents, that might be just the motivation they need to get clean. We're not talking about taking kids out of households forever and ever. Uh, we're talking about doing it until that household is safe to be in. I don't understand why that's controversial. All right, we got to skip sanity check today because we've got some uh, interviews after the show and we can't be too, too terribly late. I appreciate every single one of you. And Sitting here right now, I can't tell you for sure what Sundays with subscribers is going to be about. We have a few interviews. We're trying to decide which one is uh, the best one to put on Sundays with subscribers because we've got all sorts of content right now in the works. So anyway, that's your tea. Stay tuned for Sundays with subscribers. So subscribers, I'll see you then. Remember, we have our fifth episode of Politics Unpacked that'll be in your inboxes tomorrow morning. Lots to talk about that happened in the legislature this week. And for the rest of you, we will see you back on the live show on Monday at noon. DividedPod.com if you want to support our show for just five bucks a month.